Ja, då är klockan 12.45. Hoppas ni har fått en bra och närande lunch allihopa. Och jag ska lämna över till Viktor Lindbäck som kommer hålla en liten introduktion till vår nästa programpunkt. Viktor, varsågod. Eh, ja, men nu har vi kommit till en programpunkt som bland annat kommer att handla om svarta hål. Det kommer att handla om rymden och hur man kan tolka data från rymden genom ljud. De visuella intryck av rymden som är synliga för blotta ögat de når oss i form av ljus, till exempel i form av stjärnhimlar och norrsken. Men universum är stort och med teknikens hjälp kan vi också registrera ljus som är osynligt för det mänskliga ögat. Rymddata som registreras via till exempel Nasas James Webb Space Telescope och Hubble-teleskopet registreras i form av digital kod, alltså ettor och nollor, som vi ofta ser tolkade visuellt som vackra och mångfärgade bilder. Men digitala data från rymden de behöver inte tolkas som bilder utan de kan lika gärna tolkas i form av ljud. Vilket ger helt nya upplevelser, helt nya lager av information, helt nya sätt att förstå det som ligger på ofattbara långa avstånd men ändå verkligen finns. Och det här det är vad nästa föredrags hållare arbetar med och kommer att berätta om. Så so Kimberly, please go ahead with your presentation. Wonderful. Thank you so much. It's so nice to be here with you all this morning for me, this afternoon, I think, for you. Let me just share my screen. Great. So I'm going to talk a little bit about what we do to process our NASA data from the various telescopes that we get to work with in order to create different kinds of multiple multi-sensory experiences, particularly the sonification angle. Um, that Victor mentioned. So I work for NASA's Chandrax Observatory, which is a sort of sister telescope to the Hubble Space Telescope or to the James Webb Space Telescope. The Chandrax Observatory has been in operation since 1999, so not quite 25 years, but we're approaching. It's still to this day a technological marvel. Chandrax goes about a third of the way to the moon in order to observe deep space through X-ray light. And X-ray light is really important because it gets to answer different fundamental questions about our universe than you can if you were only looking at the universe through optical lights or through infrared light. Um, so many of you might have heard of or seen some of the images from NASA's James Webb Space Telescope over the summer and that have been continued to be released since. Um, some of the data that I get to work on looks like this. This is an image from the James Webb Space Telescope that is combined with X-ray data from the Chandrax Observatory. It's a beautiful area of stellar evolution. So where baby stars are forming and where teenage stars are sort of growing up. We get to look at other areas of the universe as well. Things like stars that are dancing together. This is a pair of binary stars where the two stars are sort of pulling energy off each other and causing a bit of a, a brightness around them through Nova. Other kinds of stars as well, such as planetary nebula, This is a type of object that is sort of like looking into the future of our own sun and perhaps six billion years or so our own solar system might look a bit like this as our sun starts to puff off its outer layers as it nears towards the end of its life and creates what's a really gorgeous um, planetary nebula structure. Um, we'll have to have evacuated the premises by then because it won't be really good to stay on Earth, but it's not for like six billion years. We have plenty of times to to find that plan. Other kinds of stars like exploded stars, so stars that are really massive that end their lives in this incredible energetic event called a supernova. And all of that leftover debris is what we're seeing on the screen now. We also get to look at things like galaxies, spiral galaxies, like our very own Milky Way galaxy with these beautiful spiral structures, all of those spiral arms where there are millions upon millions of stars tucked within and other things like black holes, like binary stars, which are just pairs of stars and like exploded stars and many other kinds of objects as well. And then we even get to look at things like clusters of galaxies that look like they're smiling back at us thanks to the bending of light or gravitational lensing around them. I always feel like we need to start our day with a cosmic smile from the universe. So that is my gift to you this morning, this afternoon. So all of this data that I've been talking about, it's all data that we have to translate from one form to another. No one is seeing X-ray light 
natively with human eyes. No one is seeing infrared light naturally with human vision. We have to process this data through a number of steps using software and coding in order to create that representation of the scientific information. We typically start out with a table. The table of information is just locating all of the time, the location and the energy of each photon, each little packet of energy that struck the detector during an observation by the Hubble Space Telescope, by the Chandrix Observatory, or by the James Webb Space Telescope, as an example. And then from there, we start to do additional processing. That processing might take the form of, say, a plot or spectra, which is like the fingerprint of the DNA of the light, or it might take the form of an image. And when our next steps are typically to add information back to that data um, through additional mathematical mapping. So that, for example, we add color to be able to help showcase the temperature or the energy of the event that was recorded. So in this case, in the image on our screen, this is a really lovely exploded star called Cassiopeia A. It's within our galaxy. It's not all that far from us. It's only about 10,000 light years away, uh, where a light year is the distance that light travels in a year, which is about 10 trillion kilometers. And we're seeing the beautiful stellar debris left over from that supernova explosion. And we can plot it in this case by energy. So we're seeing the most energetic regions as that really bright sort of yellow gold color. But when we have really good data, we can actually do even more and we can slice and dice the information by the chemical emission. So where the iron is, where the silicon, where the sulfur, where the calcium, where the oxygen, all of those chemical emissions throughout that expanding debris fields and we can map them through color. So in this case, you're seeing the iron is purple, you're seeing the sulfur, the silicon, and oxygen as the green, the orange, and the yellow, respectively, I believe. And then you're seeing a really bright sort of rim all the way around the perimeter, and that is that high energy shock. So in this case, the color is actually imparting value. It's adding to the informational quotient of the image. But when you have this kind of data that people cannot see naturally anyways, right? No one can naturally see x-ray data. No one can naturally see infrared data. Even the data from the Hubble Space Telescope, which is often in optical light, though not always, is magnified so greatly that you're getting to see things that no human from Earth can see. So this idea that we only have to prioritize the visual doesn't really seem to make sense to me, at least you know, not the only way to present that information. And so a few years ago, we started working in sonification, which is just that process of translating information into sound. So we take the, the image or the visual based representation of this, say, exploded star, our good friend Cassiopeia A, and we turn it into sound. And in this case, what we did is we took each of those chemical emissions that I mentioned earlier, the silicon, the sulfur, the calcium, the oxygen, the iron, and we assigned them to a different sound. And then each of those sounds you'll hear as we're propagating out, they're sort of blended into a harmony. Um, but here is what it sounds like. And so you're hearing those crescendos where the volume really sort of amped up because that's where those really bright regions are, where all of the calcium, the silicon, the sulfur, the iron are sort of bunched together. It's showcasing the areas where there's just a whole lot of activity, a lot of brightness, a lot of richness to the stellar debris fields that we've captured. Um, so translation of information into sound is this whole concept of sonification. It's this idea of using audio, which is non-speech based to represent or to help perceptualize data. This is a pretty growing area in like many different kinds of science, of course, astronomy, genetics, biology, but it's also being used in other sort of cultural institutions as well, such as at the Smithsonian Institution and other institutions around the world. There's quite a bit of research that's going on in this area as well that I definitely can't take credit for, but a number of colleagues have been doing active work in. So I'm going to play a few more sonifications to sort of help guide you through this concept of how we take the data and we mathematically map it into sound. What we're doing in this case is a very bespoke kind of process, meaning that we're paying particular attention to the scientific data that's included in this 
image, this data set. And we're also paying particular attention to that scientific story that we're trying to extrapolate out of it and provide with members of the public, non-experts that don't necessarily have a lot of understanding of like major or key astronomical processes. We're trying to make this science approachable and accessible. We're trying to tell the story in a way that not only makes sense, but is hopefully pleasing. So the object that we're going to walk through now is one of those beautiful galaxies that I mentioned earlier. This is the Whirlpool Galaxy, also called M51. It's not all that far away. I think it's about 250 million light years away. So in the universe, sort of, you know, a neighborhood friend, if you will. And it is, again, a spiral galaxy like our Milky Way in the fact that it has pretty strong, quite lovely spiral arms. And it also has a very bright core. And at that core of that spiral galaxy is sort of the downtown of the Whirlpool galaxy, if you will. It's where there's a supermassive black hole that's pumping out energy into the surrounding environment. There's lots of exploded stars in that area, things like neutron stars and lots of hot gas. And then as you get a little further out, you're going to see other objects as well that I'll try to talk about. So this first image that we have on the screen is actually only the X-ray data. So we're seeing only the highest energy material now. So those exploded stars, those black holes, that hot, hot gas that make up a typical galaxy like this. And we've assigned it to the highest sound. Now, I'm a former choir geek. So for me, having sounds that sort of sounds like orchestral or human voices to me is very pleasing. That is definitely a choice that we're making when we're doing this representation. We could have selected other things. But the reason we selected voices is because as we go through the steps, you'll see that all of the different kinds of light really complement each other. And we wanted to both showcase and highlight the differences, but also how they complement each other. So here is just the x-ray light. So again, you're hearing some crescendos where the brightest areas, and you're also hearing some dimmer areas where there's not as much activity. Now we're going to go to the next slide, and this is the ultraviolet light. So this is only the UV radiation that's being detected from things like hot young stars, like the size of our sun, perhaps. We're talking many millions of these stars. And now we're going to a slightly lower sound because the energy is also slightly lower. All right, and now we're going to listen to the optical slice of the light. So the visible light that our eyes might be able to catch if we were, you know, magnifying the light enough to really see it. This is the data from the Hubble Space Telescope. And now in this slice of the image, it's the same field of view that we've seen in the last two images. But now you're seeing all of that dusty material that really makes up that strong spiral structure in those arms. So here is, again, a lower... Um, pitched sound to help kind of get that midline area of, of the data. So that sound for the optical light is really tracing that structure of those dusty, gaseous kinds of arms and that beautiful spiral structure. Oh. 
Now, this last segment of the composition is the lowest energy material, the infrared material. Now we're sort of seeing down to the bones of the galaxy, if you will. We've gotten rid of some of the dust. We're not seeing as many stars, maybe only some of the cooler stars, but we're starting to really be able to peer into that cool, cool material space-wise, we're talking temperatures, um, to be able to hear again, like, like what the bones of that galaxy sort of sound like. And this is the lowest sounding note as well. Oh. So like the optical layer before it, you're hearing a more consistent sort of set of sounds as you're scanning all the way around through those spiral structures, through the really rich areas that the infrared telescope, the Spitzer Space Telescope is able to capture. It's not too far from what the previous data from the optical the Hubble Space Telescope is giving us. And it's quite different from the first two cuts in the highest energy, the X-ray and the ultraviolet. And it's really sort of helped telling a story about how these different kinds of light each present a different picture of the same galaxy, each offering astronomers a different kind of tool to be able to understand what's happening in a galaxy not too dissimilar from our own. So what do they all sound like together? Well, this is the chorus. This is the full chorus, all singing in harmony. And you'll be able to hear little tiny solos from those really, those divas, those sopranos up high that do typically like the attention. You'll hear those really bright bursts of sound from them as those sort of solos kind of cut through. Um, I like to think of the ultraviolet light as the altos, which I am an alto, that sort of steady presence that gives some really lovely harmonies to that area. And then as we get towards the optical light, now you're hearing the tenors. The tenors usually do have a really beautiful part to play in any chorus. And of course, some of my favorite sounds would be the bass. I absolutely love bass singers. And so being able to hear those bass sounds, especially as you're tracing those beautiful dusty arms of the spiral um, features, you'll hear them, I think, pretty significantly. So here's what it sounds like all united in one ensemble. <laughs> So again, you could probably really clearly hear those divas singing for all their worth at those super high notes, right? And you can also probably hear those little um, crescendos that happen around 11 o'clock and around five o'clock where the structure of that galaxy is really rich, really, really full of detail of data of light. So that is sort of one, one way that we've been able to approach our data sonification where we're picking apart the information that we're trying to talk about, to impart, and really providing a piece that as a whole can provide not only solos, but also an ensemble together that hopefully helps communicate this idea that we need many kinds of light to be able to understand the universe around us. So I'm gonna play just a couple more. And actually I forgot to pay attention to what time I started. Am I doing okay on time? If I could get a, a thumbs up, but okay, great. <laughs> Thanks, because I get a little overexcited and I just kind of keep talking sometimes. So um, we're gonna go back now to something a little closer to us in, in the universe. This is within our own galaxy. This is another exploded star. Um, a star that has just sort of vomited its guts out all over the universe. It's an, a wonderful, wonderful phenomenon to be able to witness in any stage of its evolution. These, again, are expanding debris fields. And as they expand out and dissipate all of that chemical emission throughout the universe, that makes up the future building blocks of more stars, more planets, more perhaps people. So being able to study supernova remnants is really important. Now, this next piece is essentially a comp combination of two different kinds of light, but done in a slightly different way. So in the image in front of us, we have a color-coded X-ray 
um, detailed image where the color is actually helping to provide information on the dimensionality of that data. So kind of like a painter, like some of the paintings around uh, everyone in this picture, you can see that the red is actually the um, red shifted information that is moving away from us. And the blue is that blue shifted information that is coming towards towards this. So the color is imparting a dimensional sort of quality to it. And that is all of the x-ray data that you're seeing. There's also lots of other kinds of chemical emissions here, just like the similar one before with Cassiopeia. We're picking up different emissions of silicon, of sulfur, etc. So this image in x-ray light is set upon a field of optical light so that you can see its placement in the sky. You can see that around it, immediately surrounding it in optical light, there is not a whole lot. So you're going to listen to mostly the sound as it's sort of strumming through the x-ray data, and then you'll hear those punctuations of those optical or visible light stars in between. So similarly in art, when a painter is trying to approach some sort of landscape, for example, or some sort of figure of action in the center of a painting, they really do need to pay attention to how they set the scene, right? And so in this case, we're setting the scene by providing this incredible, exciting part of all that x-ray information, that really highly energetic stellar debris that is expanding out at incredibly fast speeds. But we're situating it in a context of that optical star field, that area of the sky around it because if you look at just the x-ray image alone it could look like it was something under a microscope it could look like it was something just abstractly painted but when we provide it on a setting of the stars that are around it now you get a sense of the environment that this object is in and what i like particularly about the sonification is that sort of just a position of as you're moving out through that violence cosmic expanding debris cloud and then past that very bright sort of rim all the way around it, that shockwave, how quickly it just dissipates out into empty space. And it helps, I think, to give a sense of the fact that these objects out there in the universe, there's a lot of space in space, right? And so it's interesting to me, I think, to sort of feel that change, that drop off from all of that turbulent region to the sort of cooler, peaceful um, part of the sky that's around it. Um, I think I have time to play a couple more examples. This next example is is one of my favorites. Um, this is the central area around our very own Milky Way galaxy's core. So at the very center of our galaxy is a very massive, supermassive black hole. And luckily for us, our supermassive black hole is kind of quiet or it's kind of like taking a nap, sort of. It's had bigger bursts in its past that have heated up the gas around it, but for right now, for a while, cosmically speaking, um, it's been kind of just chilling, right? It's just kind of hanging out in the center of our galaxy doing not a whole lot. But because of that earlier bits of heating and turbulence around it, it way back, um, there is a very active area around it. So our black hole is situated in like a downtown um, a really vibrant uh, cultural area, if you will, where a lot is happening. There's exploded stars, there's stars being born, there are other sizes of black holes, there are things like neutron stars, which are really, really dense cores of stars from a long time ago. There's all of these lanes of cooler bits of gas and dust. And what we've done is similar to the M51 galaxy, the Whirlpool galaxy that we heard earlier, we've set your situated it and separated it by the different kinds of light that we're observing it in. So in this piece, you're going to hear the coolest material is the infrared data, and that you'll hear as a piano. 
the sort of mid-range material from the Hubble Space Telescope, that is going to be sort of like a plucky violin, and you'll hear this sort of a little bit more energetic um, filamentary structure. And then the highest energy material from the Chandrix Observatory is in the um, the blues and the purples, and that's the sort of highest pitch, like a glockenspiel, uh, or sort of like a xylophone type of sound. So you'll hear as we scan towards the right side of the image, there's a really strong crescendo. That bright white spot in the image is where the supermassive black hole, Sagittarius A star, resides tucked inside that sort of white cloud. So we'll hear that as we drift across this image. Again, this is another composition that just helps tell the story of how these different kinds of light are both necessary to understand the science, but how they really do interact out there in the universe. Um, this next piece is just a, a simpler piece. It's just a combination of X-ray data and optical data. This image is a pretty famous one from the Hubble Space Telescope. It's these tall columns of gas and dust where baby stars are forming. And then the X-ray data is just showcasing where there are slightly older, say the teenage stars, if you will, that are having like little temper tantrums because young stars are kind of volatile um, and they kind of like to have these temper tantrums out there in the universe. So that's what this one is. And you'll hear um, the sort of tracing of the structure of those tall pillars of gas and dust and the really high energy um, beeps and boops from the X-ray data. And then I will end with this one, which is just one of the most exciting X-ray images ever taken. Does not look it, I know, but it is. It's actually the deepest X-ray data we've ever been able to capture, well over 44 days and nights of X-ray observation of one patch of sky. It might not look all that fascinating because it's just colored dots tossed on a field of black, but it's actually thousands of black holes. So we looked deep into this one object of space for a really long time and found these hidden populations of black holes and galaxies that have supermassive black holes at their cores. So what we're hearing now is thousands of them that have been color coded by their energy. So the lowest energy black holes would be the lower sounds up to the highest with the highest sounds. And this scans from the bottom to the top. And here's what it sounds like when you're hearing thousands of black holes. Kind of love the idea that there's just these hidden populations of divas singing out their song in the universe. Um, so this, I forgot, I had one more I will play and then I will stop talking. Um, this one actually is the translation of sound from a supermassive black hole into a sonification. So this is the one example where um, none of these previous examples of the sonification are recordings of sound at all. They're the translation of light into sound. But in this case, there is actually a supermassive black hole quite literally singing out into the universe, but it's singing at a low note, so low that humans can't hear it. And it's about 57 octaves below um, middle C. So, you know, we can't hear it because we're very far away from us. This thing is hundreds of millions of um, light years away from us. 
but it's singing out this really beautiful B flat. So we took all of these sound waves that we were able to capture in the data and re-sonify them into something humans can hear. And this is what it sounds like. reason we can hear this one is because there's all this hot gas around that supermassive black hole that as that beautiful diva is sort of burping out this information into the surrounding hot gas, it's causing these pressure waves, which are indeed sound waves. And mathematically, those can be converted into a note that, that humans are familiar with. So I think it's kind of lovely, again, to think of these black holes that are out there singing in our universe. Um, so this sonification in general went pretty viral. Um, we had about 2 billion impressions throughout the world back in August and September from it. It really helped capture the imagination of people everywhere. Um, we've had pretty viral results from our sonifications, really high levels of engagement through our social media, through our digital platforms. It has been the most popular feature on the website for the Chandrax Observatory um, pretty much since 2020. Um, most of 2021, pretty big chunks of 2022. And we've done a search, a research study on this information to see how people respond to sonifications. And the response has been very, very positive. Out of about 4,500 people who took the survey, we found overall that there were equal learning gains for sighted and for blind and low vision communities. Engagement and enjoyment levels were high for both groups, but also people who were sighted learned that other people access information of the universe differently. Um, so it was really important for us when we were doing these sonifications to include people who are blind and low vision in the creation and or testing process. And so when we did the research study, it was important for us to find out if that type of work was really helping, you know, lay any groundwork for additional community interactions. Um, we were really happy with the response overall. People were very emotionally attached to the sonifications, more so than an image they might be. Um, people can absolutely have moments of awe and inspiration and all that when standing in front of artwork in a museum, when standing in front of an image somewhere in a science center. But these sounds really seem to bring that up to another level. And every comment that were, was written in, you know, sort of uh, rotely, if you will, into the open ended question came back as a sort of emotional attached response that it made me curious, that it made me sad, that it was so interesting, that it was really calming, that it was so pleasant, that it was fascinating, that it was entertaining, that it was intense, that it was haunting, right? All of these feelings that evoked emotion and um, feelings of some kind. And so I will stop there because I want to make sure we have time for questions. But, you know, for us, we're, we're exploring this, this incredibly massive universe, and there are so many objects in there to learn about. But it does me no good if I'm the only one sitting here playing in this sandbox of data. I want to make sure that other people have access to this data as well. And the images are absolutely beautiful. You know, I, I love the images and I work on them and I appreciate them. But that's not the only way we can represent information. And being able to represent through additional means such as touch and particularly through sound has for us been a really interesting way of sort of opening up the access points to our universe. You know, the the universe is a pretty big place. And what's more important than to do a universal design of our universe? Because, you know, <laughs> everybody should have the same type of access that, that I do. So um, I will stop there. And a few credits to my colleagues on the screen. All of the work on the sonifications, I have to give incredible props to Dr. Matt Russo and Ender Santaguida, my colleagues from System Sounds, very, very talented and very brilliant musicians and sound engineers. Um, as well as my BVI community members, Dr. Gary Foran and Christine Malik, for example. Um, Dr. Gary Foran is an astronomer who is blind, and Christine Malik is an amateur astronomer who is blind, and both have given incredible amounts of their time um, and thoughts um, as to how to make these things really work. So, um, yeah, much appreciated. I hope you all enjoyed the presentation. Oh, did we enjoy it? It was lovely, Kimberly. <laughs> Thank you so much. Great. <laughs> and the, the first first word that comes to mind for me is like space opera. 
<laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> yeah, and it's yes. uh, it's wonderful to hear you talking so passionate about this uh, this uh, your, the sounds and the pictures of the of the universe. I'm just going to check: Are there any questions in the chat now? Uh, then I would like to ask some questions. You were you were talking about it, but uh, what is the benefits of trying to understand space through sound? Uh, is is it just an experience, or can we actually learn something uh, only by by listening and and yeah. also you were talking about that people were very, very emo had a very emotional response why is that do you think yeah a great question so absolutely this is done in the cases that i presented to you as a way to communicate the science but that is only one very small slice of the benefits of sonification there are quite a number of researchers around the world that are actually dedicating their time to not only understanding how sonification can be used for science, but why it's important to use sonification for science. So a colleague of mine, Dr. Wanda Diaz, for example, she's an astronomer and a computer scientist who has been blind since she was about a teenager. And she uses sonification to be able to understand stellar properties, to be able to understand and detect things like different kinds of plasma, for example, around nearby stars. Her work for her PhD was all about showcasing that scientists, humans can become better listeners. And by listening to your data, you can learn new things, right? So you can kind of think of it as like that classic cocktail party effect. Not that I go to cocktail parties anymore during the pandemic, apparently, but in the before days, um, if you were sitting, for example, on a couch next to your partner, um, having a conversation and across the room for you is another group of people who you're friendly with and you can get bits of their conversation and then you're hearing the dog by the door as he gets excited that a new person's approaching and your host is in the kitchen washing a few wine glasses and you hear somebody in the dining room eating something on their plate clanking their fork and their knife right your brain is detecting all of that information all of that signal to noise and deciding which of it is the most important information to parse and keep and which of it does not need to sort of stay right so for for interest purposes they want the conversation that's important to the next to them but they might be really thirsty and they want a glass that their host has just washed and they might be expecting someone to come in the front door any minute so hearing the dog get excited that someone's approaching is giving them a clue, right? All of that information in that sort of cocktail party area around them is helping to provide them with more information that is useful to them and sort of sift through the, the junk, if you will, that noise, right? So the same thing in astronomy, at least, sonification is being used to research things like variable stars. Variable stars are stars that are changing on pretty frequent levels. Um, and pretty dramatically as well. So you have a lot of data to sift through for these changing stars and being able to look only at a plot of that information as it changes is, is one way, but it can be limiting. And if you can listen to the changes in the data, your sense of hearing has a tendency to be more sensitive to pick up those changes a little bit easier. They're also using sonification in areas like biology and medical research. They're using it to understand how proteins fold, for example, to find patterns in DNA. Um, they're using it in environmental monitoring around different kinds of populations of marine life and different kinds of populations of animals in general. So there are quite a few different ways that sonification is an actual valid tool for research. But the thing is, the field is still relatively young, right? This is as a field as a whole, it still needs a lot of growth and probably needs some standardization. And I guess I'd say as your second question, um, why is the response so emotional? It, it brings me back to, to music, right? I mean, I think so many people can track points in their life to like a soundtrack almost, right? A song comes on from when you were a teenager at a sweet 16 party and you had your first kiss, right? That song is forever ingrained in your brain. It brings you back to that moment. And as you're going through various stages of your life, there is always that sort of soundtrack of music that's playing with you, those songs that make you think of certain things, right? There's this immense power for music to really bring not only that idea of memory, but emotion that's all packaged in it. So I feel like sound inherently is a a thing that humans can, you know, tend towards giving a lot of weight to, right? So it has a lot of emotional weight potentially. And so when you hear these pieces of the universe, you're used to only looking at them and now you're hearing them. 
And it offers you a new window, a new way of understanding things, which I think for many people on the non-expert side of things has been really helpful to them to feel a little bit more connected to things around them, right? Um, that sort of connective tissue that sound and music can provide is, is quite unique. Thank you. And also, I was thinking about um, what different field of uh, uh, competence or professionals do you do you need to create this kind of sounds? I understand you're 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 a scientist, but what kind of other uh, competence is is necessary? Yeah. So for our process, it is a bespoke process, as I mentioned earlier. So we don't have one piece of software like a sausage grinder that it, the data goes through and poof, here comes a perfect sound, right? It really is about accessing and really pinpointing the scientific material and the scientific data that needs to be highlighted, that needs to be represented and keeping it very authentic. So for us, we're using um, Python to essentially create a mathematical mapping from the image-based data into the sound-based representation. But then the choices that we're using for individual sounds really depend on how things need to be told in a way that will make sense and also hopefully not like hurt people's eardrums, right? So for example, when we have many different kinds of light that we're building up, having something that speaks in harmony really helps find where those pieces overlap and where those solos are. For other kinds of data, when that's not quite as important, using like heavier synthesized sounds that really get across the structure of an object or whatever that scientific, you know, merit happens to be is really the key thing. So for us, it's a lot of coding. Uh, so having computer scientists around you is really helpful or other kinds of like coders and software developers, for example. Definitely, it makes sense to have someone who understands the science or in the case of art, the curator that really understands the perspective of the artist and how that's being situated. And then, of course, you need somebody who's well versed in some sort of sound based area, whether it's a musician or whether it's a sound engineer. We tend to work with both. Um, as I mentioned, we're working with uh, Matt Russo and Andrew Santaglita, astrophysicist slash musician one and musician slash sound engineer, uh, sound engineer the other. So what I like about sonification is exactly that which you asked. It takes a lot of different people to create these things. And I find that is a benefit. Because it's not just me looking at this data, making decisions, right? It's a group of people that are really working to tell that story in a way that will hopefully have a positive impact. And, uh, and what, what, which future do you see for the sonification of data? Is this something we will see more of and in, in different kinds of fields? I think so. I, I've definitely seen pickups of it in a number of scientific fields, and there are definitely research organizations. One is called ICAD. I forget what all the letters stand for, but ICAD. And the other is the SWC, which is the Sonification World Chat, where these are collaborations of different kinds of researchers around the world who are really thinking about these topics quite deeply and actively researching them. And there was a graph that a colleague of mine showed not too long ago that um, represented the change in awareness of sonification over time. And it was a hugely steeply traveling curve up to where we are now to, based on where we were just even like a handful of years ago, like 10 years ago, we were like way down here and today we're like way up here. So it has been quite a dramatic change um, of people embracing sonification as a tool for knowing or as a tool for experiencing. And I think that will probably continue. I think particularly as other folks learn more and more about these techniques, there will be more who bring them on board with their own work. Um, and I think based on the public response that that um, will also be embraced, you know, for the communication side of things. So at least I hope so. I really enjoy it. Yeah, that's really interesting. Uh, one last question for you. Was there anything that surprised you when, when you heard the sounds from, from space? Uh, every time I'm surprised. So mm -hmm. one of the benefits I think of sonification for me is that I've been working for Chandra for almost 25 years. I know this data inside and out, right? Like I'm one of the first people working on these images. I stare at them all the time. Like the images are enmeshed in my brain. When I hear the pieces for the first time, those outputs, those selections, those, you know, compositions, I think about the data so differently, like different aspects will come to mind. I will be familiar with a data set in the visual form and then I hear it and I'm like, oh, 
I didn't realize that structure changed right there because my eye wasn't sensitive enough to it or my eye was sort of looking over it because it was too used to the data in a way. So for me, the sonification has been another way to sort of reintroduce myself to that information. And that is exciting because you never want to sort of get, you know, used to things, right? So being able to consider them in a new way is just offers more avenues for new ideas. Well, thank you so much, Kimberly Arkan. It's been such a pleasure to have you here with us today. And uh, good luck with your future research and stuff like that. Uh, <laughs> thank, you. thank you. I so hope much. you all enjoyed it. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you.